Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation, we welcome you to New York Wines Online, a journey into the vineyard with Courtney Schizel. While we wait for everyone to get logged in, we would like to review a few logistical details. If you find yourself with streaming issues, please limit other internet users in your office or household. You may need to close all other open browsers, or you may also find it helpful to log out and log back in with Firefox or Chrome. We have two forms of communication for today's webinar, the chat and Q&A section. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other attendees. Please be sure to select all panelists and attendees in the drop down to field as it can default to panelists only. Additionally, we have the Q&A section. This is a way for you to ask questions of our on-screen panelists. Please be sure to enter any questions for the panelists into the separate Q&A section. We will do our best to get to all of the questions at the end of the session. Today's webinar is being recorded as well as streamed to Facebook Live and will be available to all attendees after the webinar. To begin today's webinar, I would like to introduce you to Courtney Schizel. Courtney is a Brooklyn-based wine journalist, educator, and consultant who has held sommelier positions at some of New York's top restaurants, including Marta, Dirty French, and Terroir. She is currently the senior editor at 750 Daily, for which she was previously a contributing editor. Her work has also appeared in Wine Enthusiast, Guild Psalm, Forbes.com, The Psalm Journal, The Tasting Panel Magazine, Beverage Media, WineSearcher.com, and many more. Courtney holds the WSET Diploma in Wines. Courtney, I'll hand the mic to you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today. My name is Courtney Shizzle, and as was described, I'm a wine journalist and the senior editor of 750 Daily and Beverage Media. I've held many roles in the wine industry, from selling bottles on restaurant floors as a sommelier to picking grapes and stomping them in Portugal, and most importantly, cleaning, as I'm sure many of the panelists here today will be able to tell you is a very important part of winemaking. Um, and actually, the first wine region I ever visited was in New York State. So it's super apropos that we're here today, and I'm really excited to taste through some great New York wines with you um, and with our panelists today. So I'm joined by three phenomenal winemakers from across New York State who are going to take us on a virtual journey into their vineyards by way of their wines. So I'd love to introduce them to all of you. We have with us today John Wagner, who's the owner of Wagner Vineyards Estate Winery in the Finger Lakes. He is a fourth generation grape grower whose father, Bill Wagner, started Wagner Vineyards. He returned to the family business in the 1990s and currently co-owns the winery with his sister, Laura. Currently, Wagner Vineyards farms about 240 acres of grapes. Welcome, John. We also have with us today Chris Coloca, who's the CEO and founder of Coloca Estate Winery, which is located just on the southern shore of Lake Ontario. Uh, Chris uh, relocated back with his family near the, his hometown of Oswego to found Coloca Estate Winery, which is located on a 103 acre waterfront property on the shores of Lake Ontario, where they planted their lake effect vineyard to cool climate varieties. We're gonna try a wine from there today. Welcome, Chris. And we also have Duncan Ross, who's the owner of Arrowhead Spring Vineyards, along with his wife, Robin. The duo made a big life change when they switched from office to vineyards, since Duncan had been making wine on the side for about 20 years. They set up Arrowhead Spring Vineyards, which is focused on vinifera varieties in the Niagara Escarpment, and they now have about 30 acres planted. Welcome, Duncan. And welcome, gentlemen. How are you today? Doing great. Happy to be here. Awesome. We're so Great. glad to chat with you. Fantastic. Yeah, doing very well. Doing very well. Fantastic. So to begin, I'd love to get us all situated as to where in New York we're talking about today. Um, so we have a map of New York State wine growing regions that we'll pull up. Um, and if you look up here, I think the Finger Lakes is a pretty great anchor to start with. Um, if we're looking at Seneca Lake, which is um, one of the lakes in the center, it's actually the deepest and the largest of the Finger Lakes. That's where we're going to find Wagner Vineyards on the eastern shore of Seneca Lake, um, located in Lodi, New York. 
If we travel a little over an hour north, we're going to hit Coloca State Winery, which is in Fairhaven, New York, right on the banks of Lake Ontario. And we'll see some beautiful photos later of that property. I definitely want to make a trip up there someday. Looks beautiful. So it's located in the Finger Lakes tourism region, but it's just outside the ABA. And then if we're gonna head west from both wineries, a little over two hours, two hours and 18 minutes, we heard in our rehearsal, um, we're gonna hit Arrowhead Spring Vineyards in Lockport, New York, and that's in the Niagara Escarpment. So gentlemen, to start off, I'd love to hear a little bit about your region that you, you know, make wine and grow grapes in um, and how it might dif differ from some of the other New York State wine regions. So um, John, can you tell us a little bit about the Finger Lakes and specifically Seneca Lake? Sure. So uh, my family's been growing grapes here on the east side of Seneca Lake for five generations. And uh, so I think the, the fact that uh, Seneca Lake is our body of water that moderates our temperature might be the most uh, distinguishing factor between me and uh, the other two panelists. So um, as you mentioned, Seneca Lake is the, the deepest and largest of the Finger Lakes. It holds about half of the volume of water as all of the rest of the Finger Lakes combined. Um, so we are on the east side. We get a prevailing northwest wind coming across that body of water, which moderates our temperatures at many times throughout the growing season. Um, most notably would be in the wintertime, um, where Seneca Lake remains open water. The last time it froze over was 1912. Um, so the fact that it remains open water, it gives up some of its heat as the prevailing northwest wind comes across there. And we, our farm is located right on the eastern side, which gets uh, the, the brunt of that impact of the temperature moderation. And I think the other thing that distinguishes me maybe from the other panelists is the topography of our site. Uh, we are on a steeply sloping site um, coming off of, of the lake. So with that, we get some really great air drainage. So certain times of the year where we might have uh, impacts from frost, um, that cold air, instead of coming down and pooling next to the vines, will rush down the hill uh, out over the lake and get some convective warming from the lake. So we've got some natural uh, assistance in preventing some of those frost events. But the, the fact that it is a steeply sloping site also makes uh, soil erosion a, a huge concern for us. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk much more about how we have combated that and through a series of other sustainable practices to conserve soil. Fantastic, thanks so much. Um, I think water moderation, you know, having the moderating effect of water is something that we'll also find talking about Chris's property, um, but we're talking about an entirely different lake because we're heading north to Lake Ontario, correct? Yeah, exactly. Well, the benefits that John talked about, um, you know, we think are exponentially magnified on Lake Ontario. Um, if you just look, go back to that map, the, the Lake Ontario, it's, it's a humongous body of water. Uh, again, it's also about 800 feet deep. And we get a wonderful wind uh, and breeze that helps keep the diseases away, the molds and the mildews. And um, not only the winds, but the, the, the soils that we have, these are glacial dug lakes, just as the Finger Lakes are. And um, what's unique to our vineyard is the uh, drumlin that it's formed on. The drumlin is a, a buildup, an upbuilding of, of gravel and sandy loam, glacial till soil that um, really provides a wonderful minerality to our wines. And um, this wonderful warming effect we get, as John talked about, and the cooling effect that we get in the summertime uh, from, from the um, lake itself is why we named and trademarked the, the name Lake Effect Vineyard. Fantastic. And then we're going to head over to the Niagara Escarpment. Um, Duncan, tell us a little bit about your region. Um, it's one of the warmer ones in New York State, correct? It is. So the Niagara Escarpment is the second warmest region in the state. Um, we, the Escarpment AVA itself is between 200 and 400 feet of elevation. So we do get some good air drainage uh, across that elevation. Our site here about a 50 to 70 foot drop depending on which vineyard you're in. Uh, the soils are uh, former lake bed uh, as many soils are in New York. Uh, lots of limestone, lots of fossils, um, veins of heavy clay, veins of sandy clay, um, some gravel, 
you know, it's sort of all mixed up in there, as I'm sure uh, John and Chris have many of the same types of uh, soils in their vineyards. Uh, definitely not as steep as the uh, Finger Lakes, but, uh, but we do get some good drainage in there. Awesome. Great. And, you know, for reference, I'm down in the non-wine growing region of Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> so I am too in New York State, but I can't even keep a Christmas cactus alive. So that's one of the ways that we differ. Um, great. Now that we're all situated, let's dive into some of these wines. Um, and I would love to encourage everybody, open the wines as we're tasting, start to taste, drop your thoughts in the chat, ask questions in the q and I'll be monitoring it as best as I can so that we can um, you know, bring your questions over to our panelists today. So we're going to start off with John and we're going to taste the Wagner Dry Riesling 2020, which I actually have right in front of me here, pulled it out of my wine fridge a little while ago to let it come to good temperature. Um, and John, tell us a little bit about, you told us a little bit about Wagner's Vineyards in general, but tell us about the plots and the vineyards that you use for this wine. Yeah, so just to back up a little bit, uh, when I started back with my father, we had one Riesling vineyard on our farm uh, planted in 1978, so it's a 43-year-old block, uh, one of the oldest in the Finger Lakes. Um, at that point, there was a lot of similarities between all the Rieslings that we produced because they were all coming off that one vineyard. Since then, we have planted uh, five additional vineyards on our farm of Riesling, so we now have 62 acres of that one variety. So we put a lot of eggs in one basket. Um, we really think it obviously has become the signature variety of the Finger Lakes. And this wine, just to put it in perspective, instead of coming off of one vineyard, it comes off of uh, four vineyard blocks on our farm. It comes off of three different clones within those blocks. Um, we have used six different yeasts um, on these different tanks of Riesling. So one of the things the winemakers can do now is we harvest all those blocks separately and vinify them separately so we can do some uh, trials with different yeast and everything. And then when we put the final blend together, we'll taste all the tanks blind and really come up with a, a lot more complex Riesling than we used to make 30 years ago because of all the different components. Um, we have uh, Riesling blocks as young as seven years old. And as I previously mentioned, a block that's 43 years old. So very different flavors off them. Um, the, the new vineyards that we're putting in we are pattern drain tiling all the soils. So even though we, uh, this is a shot of our Kwood East vineyard. Uh, this is a 15 and a half acre block, um, completely planted to Riesling in 2005. So this block that uh, you're seeing on your screen right now has over six miles of underground drain tile in it. So even though the soils uh, are predominantly honey oil loam on our farm, um, we really, realize the benefits of pattern drain tile. So we're putting this perforated uh, plastic drain pipe underneath the, the vineyards to lower the seasonal water table in those blocks because grapevines don't like wet feet. Mm -hmm. um, the shot you're seeing now is another piece of equipment that we've utilized on the farm where we have converted an old uh, grape harvester to a hill up and dehilling de machine. So you're looking at the back of the machine through it at a row of grapes. So in the fall, um, when we get a killing frost and the foliage comes off the vines, uh, we will run through all of our vinifera acreage and gather the dirt on both sides of the vine at once and hill up the graft union of the vine. So we are protecting and insulating the graft union um, so that some cyan buds are protected from the winter cold. Um, the lake gives us a lot of temperature moderation, but we still are uh, susceptible to one cold night, um, having a lot of winter kill in, in these vinifera. So um, you're seeing the, our unique octagonal winery. Um, my father started construction of the winery in 1976 after New York State passed the Farm Winery Act. Um, it still serves as our logo and the center of our wine production. We have added on over the years, various, uh, as we've expanded our production facility. Um, but no, our, our approach to, to farming out in the vineyard, we have pretty productive soils. Um, so 
one of the hallmarks of our farm is that we're using the Scott Henry training system, which is a vertically divided canopy that really maximizes the, our area of canopy, which is the vine solar collector and how it's able to collect energy from the sun uh, and ripen fruit. So in addition to additional canopy, it also opens up the fruit zone. Um, we get huge benefits to all of our vinifera varieties by uh, dividing that canopy, extra uh, area, surface area, and also supplemental uh, leaf removal in the fruit zone. So especially on our reds here in the Finger Lakes, uh, we try to get that fruit zone opened up early in the season, um, get a lot of sun exposure on the fruit. We can get further flavor development and just a nice open canopy where things will dry out quicker. Um, just to put it in perspective, out of the last 17 days, we've had uh, 14 days of measurable rainfall. So wow. uh, growing grapes in New York is, is ch a challenging endeavor and uh, you got to be on top of things and really do things in a timely manner to get things done in the vineyard. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember visiting, I think, two years ago, and it was just pouring the entire time I was there. But that was not the case last year with this vintage, correct? Uh, 2020 was about as dry as it gets here. Um, mm. We, um, as you taste this wine, I mean, one of our hallmarks is really letting the fruit hang uh, longer in the vineyard. Uh, if we can keep, keep things clean, keep the canopy healthy and functioning, uh, we can really push the, the ripeness on these, on these grapes and on the wine. Um, flavor is created in the vineyard. Um, there's, there's a lot of winemaking techniques out there for adjusting various chemistry of the juice, but you, you still cannot create flavor. So um, we, we grow, we are 100% estate bottled. So all of the wines that you get from Wagner Vineyards are from grapes grown on our farm. Um, we think that gives us kind of the ultimate control of what we want to do in the vineyard uh, viticulturally. Um, as we get closer to harvest, uh, numerous passes to sample, making sure we've got the, the chemistry of the juice in a workable range, and then it, it comes down to flavors. We start, uh, you know, eating grapes, uh, looking at seed color, chewing on skins, and when we really think that the flavor development is where it needs to be, um, you know, we've got quite a history of, of uh, behind us of looking at these vineyards and knowing how far we can push them, how the foliage is looking. So um, we do mechanically harvest um, almost all of our Riesling. Uh, this is mechanically harvested. So we have a, a unique harvester built in France. It's the Gregoire. Um, one of the unique features, it has onboard destemming. So all the grapes are destemmed right in the vineyard. Uh, the, the stems are composted back on the vineyard floor. What this allows us to do is do a lot of night harvesting, which uh, really mm -hmm. pays big dividends on Riesling. We like to get them cool, we like to get them dry, and we like to get them at the peak of ripeness. So um, we get, a, as we previously talked about, a lot of changing weather patterns. Uh, we can get things, storms coming up the coast and everything, and we're really able to um, keep a keen eye on the weather forecasts and really harvest grapes at the peak of ripeness uh, quickly at the at the proper conditions. So. Um, what we're bringing into the winery is clean, ripe fruit. Fantastic. And you were saying that, you know, you work with different plots of Riesling now that you can harvest separately and vinify separately, and that adds complexity to this wine. Is there a typical style that you're looking to create with this wine, or are there certain plots that you look to for different characteristics? Yeah, definitely. So, I, I would think one of the changes, uh, you know, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, when we were making Rieslings, the, the thought was maybe looking at the world's best Rieslings that are produced and trying to emulate some of those styles. And I think we really come into our own knowing that we are going to produce the best Riesling that we can here in the Finger Lakes. And, um, you know, some people uh, shy away from having a lot of fruit in, in there. And this one, I think it really is, is showing well uh, for as young as it is. It's just got a lot of complexity in the nose. Um, we're looking to celebrate that Riesling fruit in there. Um, and in, we use the IRF scale on all of our wines. So you'll, you'll see on the back label um, how that compares in sweetness to other wines. So really truth in labeling, uh, we want the customer to get uh, what they want to get. We, we do make a, a uh, single vineyard Kwood East, which is a, a more dry, even, even drier than this. 
And that one is more minerality, um, very laser fo focused. This one is a, is a rounder style, this 2020 dry. Um, and being comprised of several different blocks, I mean, I think we really can see the layers of flavor that you get from that, from those different clones. The harvest date also varies. Um, the range on this wine is from the 17th of October to the 27th of October. So okay. you can get some different characteristics by just, uh, just different harvest dates as well. But definitely a, a rounder style. Um, this east side of Seneca Lake wines tend to be a little riper fruit going into these wines. So you'll get a little bit more of that varietal characteristic out of it. Um, some of the sites that might not have quite as many growing degree days as we do here on the east side of Seneca Lake might be a little leaner um, and, and, and maybe not, not quite as, as much mouthfeel as this one has. For sure. Let's open it up to our other panelists. What do you all think of this wine and how it you know, might express? I mean, John knows his site better than anyone else, but you also know the Finger Lakes and Seneca Lake well. So tell us a little bit about what you think of this wine. I think it's delicious. Uh, can, congratulations again, John. Um, it, it's Thank you. A, you know, it's unique in style, these Finger Lakes wines. Um, they're uh, crisp and dry. And I, and I love the focus that we're seeing more on the dry style that, we're, that is different than it was 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just delicious. And um, it just shows what, uh, you know, I fully agree with what John says is the the expression of the fruit and the layers, the, the different uh, honeysuckle, the green apple, the, the lemon lime zest. Uh, it's, uh, and it's, again, it's, it's, a, it's a 2020, so it's only gonna get better. Absolutely. I really appreciate the dimension on this wine. I think as you were saying, it's a little bit broader and rounder, but the acidity is just so finely focused, which really brings it all together um, at the end. And I really appreciate that about this wine. And I think, uh, you know, in our comments here, people are saying it's super refined, um, lots of great uh, fruit characteristics, taste dry. So we're getting good reception from our tasters as well. Yeah, it's very well balanced and um, getting that little hint of petrol uh, in a good way that uh, good reasons have. And the thing that's remarkable here, you know, not not just about this wine, is that you know, Wagner Vineyards has been able to maintain quality over decades. And, and I think that's important to note. That's not easy to do. And um, the innovation that I've seen over the years from being a consumer and visiting Wagner and then watching you know, what John's done in the vineyards with specialized equipment and you know, he had a planting thing for replanting vineyards at one point, um, really remarkable. Uh, great ingenuity and uh, staying on top of quality for that many years is uh, quite an achievement. That's a great point. Appreciate the words, Duncan. Fantastic. And John, before we close out, um, has your approach to farming these vineyards changed all over the years besides some of the things that you've already spoken about? It definitely has. It, you know, we, we do have the long history of, of farming grapes here and, uh, you know, the varieties have definitely changed um, from what my great grandfather and grandfather farmed, which were primarily natives. Um, my dad was a, was a large grape grower for the Taylor Wine Company back in the, in the 50s and the 60s. So we had quite an expansion of French American hybrids, but really all the, all the emphasis and focus uh, since the late 70s, early 80s has been in vinifera wine production. So um, huge changes in the fact that the yeast varieties are, are, are not the same. I mean, they're all, they're all grafted. Um, that graft union takes a lot of extra attention to really, we, we are on the edge of growing vinifera here. And as all mm -hmm. the, uh, Chris and Duncan will attest to, I mean, we need that slight temperature moderation that we're getting from our site, from the, those bodies of water. And sometimes it's just a few degrees on one night that might make the difference whether we have a full crop or a 30% crop. So um, really going from non-shoot position training systems that we had 40 years ago to like highly intensely managed canopies, um, grapevines don't like to grow in a vertical plane. So if you look down our rows right now, as you've seen some of the photos that have gone up, 
Um, they're very narrow rows. Uh, we're using movable catch wires to put the canopy where we want it and uh, manipulate things so that we got fruit exposure and we can treat the fruit zone a little differently than the rest of the canopy. So, I mean, not only have we changed a few things, we've just completely reinvented and changed almost everything, uh, how we approach vineyard um, development now. Um, the pattern drain tile is relatively new in the last 20 years. Um, almost everybody in the Finger Lakes that's doing large plantings of vinifera now is, is, is supplementing their well-drained soils with pattern drain tile. So huge investment up front, um, but you really just get one chance to do it right. It's very difficult to retrofit and put some of these things in later because you have these permanent trellises um, in the way. So yeah, we, we've uh, really expanded our Riesling acreage. Uh, we do have the most diverse and, and widely planted Riesling site in the Finger Lakes. And now we're in the process of doing the same thing with Cabernet Franc. Um, we, oh. we now have 28 acres of Cab Franc. So, we think that's uh, where our future is on the red side of things. So, very cool. That's fantastic. I yeah, I mean, go ahead. I just hope everybody enjoys the wine and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Of course. Thank you so much. I think it's a great point to make about how, just how much things have changed, even in the course of, you know, what, 30, 40 years. Um, and I think that's true across a lot of New York State, which is what makes New York, to me at least, one of the most dynamic winemaking states and wine regions out there right now. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. All right, now we're going to move on to some red wines with Chris. So Chris, we're tasting your 2019 Coloca Lake Effect Vineyard Pinot Noir. Um, and you told us a little bit about the Lake Effect Vineyard, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about the Lake Effect Vineyard and also your journey with it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, thanks so much, uh, Courtney, for hosting, and thanks to the New York Wine Grape Foundation for uh, supporting this uh, opportunity today. And you know, for, you know, for me, it's like a dream come true to be able to sit alongside you know somebody like John Wagner. Um, you know, 12 years ago, we planted our first vineyard, and when we planted, I had a lot of confidence that we could grow Riesling. And so, you know, John has given us a lot of uh, information and data, and uh, you might look at that as, you know, we can look at it as it's like R&D, mm -hmm. uh, research and development, but I like to call it rip off and duplicate is the R&D. So we could take this information and we can learn from it. And, and boy, did I learn. The journey was incredible. I had a, a full business plan. We were all set, bought this beautiful parcel of, of a property that's right on Lake Ontario. The soil profile looks fantastic. I got the soil maps. I've studied them all. I've got my spreadsheet with my business plan. How many posts, how many um, uh, feet of trellis wire, how many plants, we're gonna do 100% vinifera. And um, I had a lot of confidence that we could grow Riesling, but I, I didn't have a lot of confidence in Chardonnay and Pinot Noir because they're um, a little bit more delicate and uh, Riesling has already shown proof of concept uh, in the Finger Lakes and maybe the others have had a little bit more challenges. But anyway, uh, the funny thing that John says about tiling, I had this whole business plan and spreadsheet, but what I failed to have in there was drainage. And so when I talked with uh, Cameron Hosmer, who planted our, our vineyard, he said, and what are you doing for drainage? What, who's doing the tiling? And I said, what do you mean drainage? Well, I'll tell you that put it, plugging that number into the business plan uh, doubled the, the idea of uh, what I had in mind. So, oh. and that's just the beginning, right? That all these guys could attest to. But um, we did seven miles of drainage every 27 feet throughout the vineyard to make sure we have well-drained soils. And um, as John said, I, I'm so glad we did it because you, you have one chance to do it before you, you go ahead and plant. So we installed uh, a 12 acre vineyard, eight acres of Riesling, two acres each of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir um, right here on the shores of, of the Great Lake Ontario. So the Pinot Noir, we like to let hang also. So it's a bit risky because you're looking at the weather and you're wondering if it's going to continue to ripen or if it's stopped ripening. So we're taking samples and looking at the acids, seeing if the acids are, are, are changing as well as the, the sugars going up. Um, we're really fortunate that sure we can do some you know, quick analyses here on site, but we can also quickly send a sample down to, the, to Cornell and mm -hmm. in, uh, overnight, uh, or sometimes same day, we get a full lab from their um, uh, uh, lab that is uh, something that, that I could never afford. 
And um, so with that, we make the decision to pick. We invite friends, family, neighbors, they all come out and we have a wonderful hand-picked vineyard party. So it's just at the top of the screen is the uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay block. So on the bottom part of the screen, you're looking at our Riesling block of our Lake Effect Vineyard. And you can see right off to the, to the top of the screen is the um, Great Lake Ontario. So because we've had success with this Pinot Noir, and um, I'll talk a little bit about the wine in just a bit, we just planted another 15 acres. So we've expanded our plantings um, and it's more, uh, four acres more of Chardonnay, four acres more of Pinot Noir, and we added Cabernet Franc and a small block of Pinot Gris that we're excited. So we are 100% vinifera um, on our mm -hmm. farm as well. So these are some of the uh, buildings that we have on the property. And what we found is because we're not right on a uh, high traffic wine trail, we're a member of the Lake Ontario wine trail, but the next winery from us is about a 30 minute drive. So we quickly oh, wow. found out that people would come and visit and taste our wines and they'd say, okay, now what? And so we, we built a wood fire oven. We uh, said, hey, you can purchase a bottle of wine or buy a glass of wine and relax and have a pizza. We uh, built an outdoor wine bar. We started having live music for people to come and visit. And this is our brand new 10,000 square foot event center. So it's our um, a just finished project. And this year we have over 56 weddings and events booked um, for, for 2021. So it's a lot of fun. We can host up to 600 guests seated and much more than that in a, in a standing capacity. So we've had to kind of, it's, it's, as I call the, the tail wagging the dog, um, we're, we're just continuing to react to what the market is showing us. And, um, the other thing that I found is we really enjoy uh, selling the wines retail in our in our bottle shop and our own winery. Um, indeed, we do distribute and we have our wines at you know retailers and at restaurants. But with this Pinot Noir, there's not very much of it. We entered our 2018 Pinot Noir into the New York International uh, uh, Wine Competition, which was in New York, and it uh, scored 94 points. And uh, after that, it sold out. We only had about 200 wow. cases and it was gone. So we're on the 19 now. And um, I think this wine is, is nice. It's delicate, it's soft. It has a nice expression of earth. Um, we age this for about a year in a combination of new oak and also um, 500 liter barrique. So more of a Burgundian style. Um, we, we hand pick the fruit. We bring the fruit um, in and, and crush. We uh, let the uh, berries sit and uh, steep. We uh, punch down two times daily and let the, um, the natural extraction of the skins take place um, over uh, 12 to 15 days uh, prior to pressing. And um, this has this lovely uh, strawberry color and um, nice fruit notes. Uh, if uh, you wanna have a taste and see what you think. Definitely. And Chris, we also have a question. Um, who are the coopers or cooper for your barrels? Yeah, so we use um, a variety of coopers. We use uh, Francois Frere is, is one that we've used quite a bit. And we also have been using one called uh, Tonnelier that mm -hmm. we uh, source as well. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I get a lot of that bright red fruit and on the palate, it's like a real tart red fruit. And as you were saying that earthiness, it's almost a little salty and really get that acidity. Um, it's so fresh. I, I think it's wonderful and be great with so many dishes. Well, thanks. We, um, I, I'm getting some cedar, cedar notes, um, hints of the hints of the forest, um, those types of things as well. Yeah, this is a great food uh, food pairing wine. We we love this with with uh, duck breast or, or confit. Uh, it goes really well. But I mean, this goes great with with cheese or with chicken or uh, with most anything. For sure. And um, one of our uh, attendees here today says that she would like to hold it for a few years to see how it develops. Have you held back some of your pinots in the past? We have. So I take 10 cases each vintage and put them into the library and then we revisit those wines. And um, we host quite a few wine pairing dinners here as well, where we can go back and have some verticals and um, have some fun with going going back on older vintages. 
Fantastic. John and Duncan, what do you think? So I, I like, I love this wine. This is uh, just a beautiful light, uh, light in color, but full in flavor. Uh, very clear. It's got some raspberry on the nose, which is very typical of, uh, of Pinot, I think, in New York State, uh, at least upstate. It's very nice. Yeah, it's nice not, it's not nice over. Soft. You yeah, know, nice, what we're nice seeing... and soft, very well balanced. Well, thanks, guys. It's very kind. Um, well, what we're seeing is um, we think Pinot Noir is, is worth the risk. And what I mean by that is we kind of double down because if we have a year that the, the bricks aren't coming up where we are likely to see them, we could just make a sparkling and, or we could make a rosé. So again, you, we, could, we, can make, we can do different things with what, the, what nature gives us. And uh, you know, I, I fully agree that it all begins in the vineyard. Absolutely. And, you know, you talked a little bit about how you're planting some more vines and investing in some more Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and some new varieties. Has your approach to farming changed at all since you started planting this vineyard? Yeah, it, it has. You know, when I started, I thought, boy, if I can just get more grapes, I can make more wine and we all have more bottles to sell. And then you quickly begin to learn, well, you know, uh, if you, the, this vine only has so much energy. Mm -hmm. So if you do some certain practices, you can actually uh, target quality. And uh, we do that. So um, right now the team is in the vineyard um, hedging right now and, and getting the uh, canopy exposed. Uh, we'll be doing some, some leaf dropping straight away. And so we, we go through at the, at the fruit wire and, and drop the, the leaves, uh, especially on, on just the, the uh, east side to begin. And the other thing that we're doing is some, some shoot thinning at early on, where we're, we're actually dropping fruit and, and shoot thinning as well, so that we um, end up with a crop size of about two tons per acre. So it's, it's not a lot of fruit where we probably could get three, but, um, Again, the two that we get, we're able to get it right, to the ripeness that we're, we're looking for uh, most years, not, not, not all the years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it speaks a lot to the fact that this is, you know, a lake effect, a cool vineyard plants, a cool climate variety is that this Pinot Noir is only 12% ABV, correct? Right. Yeah, it's, it's low alcohol. And again, that's because we're, we're not Willamette Valley. We're, we, you know, we're not um, in Sonoma, California. We're not going to get the bricks to 28. Um, so uh, so we, we work with what we have and uh, we'd, we'd rather make it in, in that type of Burgundian style. It's going to be lower alcohol and it's not going to be a huge fruit bomb. And I, and I think you also get some of the acidity. Uh, you can taste the acidity, which will help preserve this wine over time as well. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing this with us today. It's delicious. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to taste it. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to show our wines. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, now we're heading over to Arrowhead Spring Vineyards with Duncan, and we're tasting the Arrowhead Red 2017, which is a blend of Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot. Um, so Duncan, tell us a little bit about these vineyards, about this wine. So I'll start with the wine. Um, the wine is a blend, uh, as you can see, of Cab Franc, Cab Sauv, and Merlot, as it is every year. We no longer put the blend percentages down on the bottle um, because what we're shooting for is we're shooting for this uh, riper, approachable flavor. Um, you know, it's, it's our entry-level wine. It's uh, two years in oak, so a combination of French, American, some Eastern European oak. Um, tends to be more than neutral barrels, uh, so a little bit less oak influence than our reserve wine. But uh, big flavors, uh, smooth, ripe, and um, ready to drink as opposed to our reserve, which I like to let sit in the bottle for five or six years before uh, popping that one. Um, we grow, uh, it was interesting because in prepping for this, I, I started noodling my spreadsheet. Um, 52% of our vineyards, so we've got 48 acres, we've got 32 of that planted. 52% of that's Bordeaux varieties. So primarily Cab Franc, uh, followed by Cab Sauve and then Merlot. 31% um, are Burgundian varieties. So Pinot Noir, primarily it's about 75% Pinot Noir and 25% uh, uh, Chardonnay. 
And then 17% Rhone varieties, um, Syrah, and then we've got a couple acres of Viognier that uh, I'm looking forward to playing with in a couple of years. And we just planted that last year. Very cool. Um, you know, the soils, you know, limestone based, um, we're back from the lake. You can see that the edge, and eh, not of that picture, but there'll be one, I think, coming up. Yeah. So at the edge of that, about six, seven miles away is like Ontario. Mm. Uh, we're up near the top of the escarpment, about 400 feet, um, 375 at the top of our vineyard. That holds in the warmth from the lake and it creates a lot of wind. Uh, so as the um, land warms up in the early spring, that creates uh, air rising over the land, which draws the breeze in from the lake. Uh, very similar and near any body of water, but we're constantly getting that air re recirculation. A little bit more frost prone than the lake shore, but not terribly. Uh, we get a couple more weeks out of the uh, season as a result. Um, typical harvest on these is uh, 24 bricks. Um, we've been as high as 27, which uh, we try to avoid, and uh, as low as 22 bricks. Uh, that's percent sugar. Um, and that, that lets us finish between 12 to 13 and a half percent alcohol, um, okay. which, which I, th I think balances with the, the acidity in the region. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you're saying that you have a mix of Bordeaux varieties, Rome varieties, you know, Burgundian varieties in the region as a whole, what do you think is showing the most promise? So in this region, um, we've, we've got hundreds of years of fruit growing experience here, apples, peaches, pears, cherries. Um, it's been, you know, along the lake shore and then, then on the escarpment, mostly that. Um, the wineries really didn't start taking off again. There's been three or four starts and stops to the wine region over the past 100 or 200 years. Um, and there's still a lot of, uh, Concord Catawba being grown for Welch's. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the bulk of the acreage of grapes. But the wineries that are planting vinifera are doing really well with Riesling. Uh, Cabernet Franc uh, is very big here. Pinot Noir, a uh, really good reason, region for Pinot Noir. And, and of course, Chardonnay. Chardonnay does so well across the state that uh, you, you can't go wrong with a New York State Chardonnay uh, mm -hmm. in a restaurant. Absolutely. We have one question um, on the wine itself. Um, do you have a percentage of new oak and size of the oak barrels used for this? So that's a great question. That's going to vary by year, um, depending on the flavor of the grapes. But typically, percentage of new oak in here is uh, probably, probably around 15%, pretty low. Okay. And um, we, we don't do a lot of new oak for Merlot at all. And um, we primarily use punchins, which are 500 liter barrels, uh, double size for things like Merlot um, and Syrah, which doesn't go into this blend. Fantastic. And can you tell us a little bit about this vintage and you know how this blend kind of came together? Yeah, uh, so 17 was a pretty typical year here. Um, rained every couple of weeks, pretty sunny. Um, we get a lot of sunshine because we are between the lakes. Mm -hmm. uh, so Lake Ontario is to the north, Lake Erie is to the south. The prevailing wind is from the west, uh, typically comes directly over Ontario and keeps us uh, cloud free most of the summer. Um, you know, not the last couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but most of, of the time, uh, it's pretty sunny. And um, we also don't tend to get hurricanes. Um, I, was, uh, I was super tempted to bring the 18, um, but we just didn't have labels on it yet oh, okay. uh, because apparently 18 was uh, you know, a tough year for most of the East Coast, but um, you know, we don't, the, the hurricanes kind of stop around Rochester. Mm. Uh, usually, not always, uh, occasionally they do pop through. Very cool. Uh, gentlemen, John and Chris, what do you think of this wine? Yeah, I think the, the ripe fruit that Duncan talked about really shows through well. Um, 
big, big wine, powerful, and yet it's so smooth and, and easy to drink. And uh, I think all the wines, when we talked about the lower alcohol, I think that's going to be a plus for uh, New York wines. Um, not having these wines that are 15% alcohol, it just really makes it uh, food friendly, easy to drink, delicious. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is a great example of how you can have a wine that has really um, ripe fruit, lush fruit, is very approachable, but isn't, you know, a bruiser that you would find in other regions. Yeah, for me, um, my brother got me into wine. Uh, that's how I got started. And he was a Bordeaux collector. So uh, I bought uh, 12 cases of Bordeaux Futures in 2000 when I got my first job. And I'm glad I did because they've appreciated it quite well, uh, both drinking and uh, price-wise. But you, uh, the, so I've been to Bordeaux. I visited the chateaus, and you know th this is this is right on par with it with a French Bordeaux blend. This is this is it. And uh, congratulations, Duncan. It's a it's a great wine. Um, and I and again, I think it has a, a bit of the acid also that that's on the tip of my tongue. And what I'm getting with this. And a bit on the sides, I'm getting, um, you know, the, the beautiful fruits, the black fruits and, um, and the earthiness and the wood. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's delicious. And at that price point, uh, boy, you should buy it by the case. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, for, you know, 2017, now we're looking at, you know, almost uh, four years since harvest. This still tastes so fresh and I'd love to see how it evolves over the years as well. Yeah, two of those years there were in barrel. So and it's two years in barrel, three months in tank, letting it, letting all the wines get used to each other. Mm -hmm. Blended. Great. And can you tell me a little bit about your approach to farming here? Yeah. So we have been sustainable since the beginning. Uh, we started out going for organic certification. Uh, and one of the products we were using came off the list and we just never kind of restarted that. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't use herbicides. Um, we're doing mechanical tilling under the vines. Um, minimal spray uh, type material, nothing, nothing crazy. Um, but you know, even organic farmer spray. Um, and we found as we did more and more research that you know the organic spray is like copper. Uh, copper is heavy metal. Uh, is not particularly good for the environment. So um, my wife, Robin, is really the expert in that area. Uh, but in terms of farming and how we've evolved over the years, um, we put in drain tile every eight feet on our first vineyard because we have springs literally on the hillside. I mean, we bought this gorgeous hillside in the first vineyard. I think, oh, maybe we won't have to use too much drainage and it won't cost too much. As it turns out, as soon as we dipped it up, you see these like giant wet spots out on the hill and they go, oh, where's that coming from? And uh, you dig down and you find out it's just a mud pit. So uh, extra drainage on our hill because of the hydraulic fracturing inside the rocks that uh, just happens to be underneath that particular site. Um, and everywhere else is about every 16 feet. I could probably get away with more, but that first experience has left us uh, a, little, a little shy. So... Um, we've been pushing for more and more automation. You saw a photo of a harvester. We're, we're using Gregoire harvesters, as John is. Uh, tremendous boost in terms of uh, not only productivity, but we just couldn't find the labor. Uh, getting the labor and competing with the apple farms in the fall. All of our materials come in in the fall. It's not like brewing beer where, you know, we just order more grain and make more beer. I mean, everything comes in at once. You got to have enough tanks to hold everything. And then in the spring, your tanks were pretty much emptying. <laughs> and then you start again. Um, leaf removal has been key to quality here. So we've automated that. Um, again, with labor, it was really tough to get through manually. And, you know, I find myself out there, you know, early mornings, late evenings, trying to get through leaf removal. Now we have a machine that does that and just pulls it off. Um, we used to do the Scott Henry trellis, which was uh, tremendous for us, but since the leaf removal, we, we still do the double uh, fruit cordon, but everything goes up and we do it in two different zones. So two different layers, about eight inches apart. Um, 
and uh, with the leaf removal allows us to get in there, do two passes and keep that fruit zone clear. Um, and yeah, wherever we can automate, we're, we're automating the heck out of it uh, as long as we don't uh, impact quality through that automation. But getting the fruit off the vines quickly has been tremendous. Getting the leaf removal done, the hedging, hedging's made a difference as well. For sure. And from what I, what I hear, labor is going to be an even bigger issue this year, perhaps. So it's good to have those processes in, in place. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And we've, we've got very, very good people working here and, uh, you know, they're hopefully going to stick with it. So that's, <laughs> anybody, anybody with a business who has really good people, um, will tell you that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, I really appreciate it. I'd love to open it up um, to um, all of our attendees. Please drop questions if you have anything that's gone unanswered so far um, in our Q&A or in our chat, um, and I'll throw it over to uh, our panelists. Uh, but for, you know, to close things out, let's talk a little bit about what things are looking like this year. How are you expecting the 2021 vintage to look? Um, why don't we start with Duncan, since we were just chatting. Sorry, I caught you right after you went on mute. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you're going to have to repeat. Sorry, I was reading this thing in the chat, which might yeah, be. Yeah, no, no problem. How's the 2021 vintage looking? 2021 vintage is looking pretty good. Um, we've had a couple weeks of rain off and on. Um, but the rain, the patterns of rain are, are quite different than when I was growing up in the region in hmm. the 60s and 70s. We're getting these rain events that are an inch, you know, an inch and a half of rain. It's not like, you know, the, I'd get a half an inch of rain over 12 hours. I mean, that inch of rain comes in 30 minutes. And wow. uh, it's very different. So it comes in, it hits, it runs off. Um you know, loads up the soil underneath. So that's why the drain tile is really important, uh, particularly with that kind of rainfall. And it's very spotty um, in terms of, uh, you know, I hear a lot of thunder south of me oh, okay. um, for the last couple of days, and it hasn't really rained here much, you know, other than a sprinkle, but it's, you know, it's hit and miss. Uh, 2016 was like that. It was hit and miss and we never got rain. We went for four months with no rain wow. and it, it rained half a mile from here. Um, but 2021 is shaping up to be a pretty good year. Excellent. John, how's it looking over there in the Finger Lakes? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo what, what Duncan has said. I mean, early season, we actually want to get the early canopy fill, um, which we've gotten this year. Uh, so the challenge has been uh, what to do with that canopy. So they're uh, with both the vertical shoot positioning or Scott Henry training systems, there's a lot of manual manipulation of those shoots. So uh, we've had to really stay on top of moving movable catch wires to get that canopy displayed, but we're, we're super psyched about where we're at right now. Um, um, if it dries out now, that would be a great thing uh, just because we, we would much rather have it raining now um, while the vines are at this stage than in September and October, because if we get, uh, especially some of these varieties we're talking about, like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, Riesling, thinner skin varieties, if we get a lot of rain um, during harvest, it, it can be challenging keeping skins intact and things like that. So rain now is not as big a problem, um, just makes life a little more challenging. But also, as Duncan said, being able to automate things is, is not a shortcut for us. We think automating leaf removal, automating harvesting really gives us better quality than we were able to do before because we can really do things um, more timely. Um, you know, we're, we're leaf pulling on uh, 140 acres uh, with, with one machine, which is a collard pressurized air leaf remover. So we can cover a lot of ground in a hurry and getting it done early season, we think is better than, than doing it later season where you might be exposing the clusters, but you're not getting some of those benefits that you would get from season long exposure. So um, it's a little early to talk about, you know, final quality assessment of the vintage, but right now we're, we're poised for a great vintage. 
Fantastic. Great to hear. Um, we've been hearing a lot about, you know, heat waves in other parts of the country. Is heat something that you're concerned about this year so far? Uh, I, I think in these cool climates, heat is, is not something that worries us. Um, it does tend to increase disease pressure a little bit when you're wet and humid. Um, but right now, as far as growing degree days, Cornell tracks the growing degree days for the growing season. We are running uh, about six or seven days ahead of, of where we would normally be at this point in the season. So as okay. grape growers, we, we're always loving the years where we're ahead. Um, bloom, the date of bloom really predicts date of harvest uh, closer than any other factor. And we, we, we had bloom six or seven days ahead of when we would typically have it. So um, it just sets us up for allowing us to ripen in the fall um, versus a year where we might be behind the eight ball. We've had years where we were 10 or 12 days behind the average of a year. And that that's, mm. you, you really start to worry and you start to have to drop some fruit. Um, we'll look at our late season uh, for instance, our Cabernet Sauvignon in a year like that, and we'll, we'll drop fruit early because we don't think we can get it all right. But right now we're, uh, we're ahead of the average and uh, that's, that's a good place to be. So. Great. Hey, can't get enough heat. I mean, the, the stuff that's happening out West is, you know, 110 degrees, you know, 90 is hot here. Right. For sure. It always feels a little bit hotter down here in, you know, in the city where you have to, uh, you know, wait for the subway everywhere you go. <laughs> um, Chris, anything else to add to what these two have shared? Well, we saw the same thing. We saw um, bud break and, and bloom about a week early, and uh, that was exciting. But not only that, May, if you recall, was really sunny and warm. And I remember so many Mays uh, that you, you wonder if it's spring or if it's still winter. And um, we had a, just a glorious, glorious May. And that turned into June with sunshine. And now uh, in July, we're having a, a lot of heat and, and sunshine. So uh, the vines are going crazy. They, um, you know, just to comment on um, from a, from a, um, a hand um, trellis handling system, uh, we have four employees full time and they're getting 45 to 50 hours in a week just to keep on, keep on top. And it, it, whenever you look, there's, there's another job to be done. We have to go back through and, and grape hoe again uh, to, to look after the weeds. We have to go back through and, um, and tuck and, and train and, and um, continue to hedge and all, you know, all the different things. We, we realize that we go through and touch the vines nine to 10 times, every vine. And, and we're small and we're only 12 acres. So when you look at John or you look at Duncan with uh, Duncan's in the 30 to 40 range and, and John at 240 acres, I mean, my goodness. Uh, yeah, you, you have to have help with, uh, with machines and uh, thank God we have those types of technologies. But uh, uh, the vigorousness um, is, is a characteristic of, of New York grape growing. It goes along with what we see in our orchards. And I think it's all testimony to the fact that we can grow grapes in, in New York State, there's no question. I think we all know that, but it's exciting that we can grow vinifera and um, doing it with some of these techniques that we can learn from others really, I think, um, uh, helps us be successful. Fantastic. We have one question. Um, in terms of growing degree days, what zone are you all in? Or in terms of how that's classified? Uh, Base 50, I think maybe that is what the question is addressing. Okay, great. Fantastic. That's like the USDA or uh, growing zones that they have? Yeah, or in terms of, you know, the like the Winkler index or something like that. Fantastic. Well, gentlemen, if you don't have anything else to add, I'd love to thank you all for being here. Thank you to everyone who tuned in, who listened, who tasted along with us. I hope you have some of this fantastic wine still to enjoy throughout your weekend and hope maybe share, maybe not share. I don't know. You can do whatever, whatever makes you happiest, but it's been a pleasure to, to be with you all today. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Thank you, Courtney. Thanks, Courtney.
Well, a big thank you to all of you for attending and to Courtney, John, Chris, and Duncan. Uh, thanks to all of you for a terrific session. As a reminder, uh, we hope you will join us for our next upcoming event, which is in the varietal series on Tuesday, July 27th at four o'clock PM with a Cab Franc State of Mind with Kevin's Rally. Uh, thank you again and have a great rest of your day.